The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The economic disruption of this pandemic can be seen almost everywhere, but tonight we're looking at one place where the hurt is largely unseen, the hidden office economy. And what's happened to all those small businesses that cater to workers who once filled high rises, but now work from home. Then, if these were normal times, university students would be about to come home from school for their first long weekend. There'll be a lot less of that this Thanksgiving, so we'll check in on what this COVID era post-secondary year is like so far. It's Thursday, October 8th, and that's ahead on the agenda. In business centers across the province, this pandemic has induced an eerie quiet. That's especially true for places such as the normally bustling concourses beneath office towers everywhere. Think of all those coffee shops and gift stores, shoe repair and myriad small service and retail outlets that thrive on the daily foot traffic of thousands of workers, many of whom are now working from home. What's become of those folks and their businesses? Well, let's find out. We're going to ask in Bowmanville, Ontario, Grant Humes. He's executive director of the Toronto Financial District BIA, the business improvement area. And here in the provincial capital in the beaches, Samantha Sanella, Managing Director of Strategic Planning at the global commercial real estate firm Cushman & Wakefield. And right in downtown, Joseph Bennett, a hairstylist who has been working in Toronto's underground path system for nearly 30 years. And it's great to welcome all of you to TVO tonight. Grant, get us started here because you represent the companies and the retailers uh, which really do truly make up this hidden office economy. When you are looking at the retailers and the hospitality industry and the service providers, uh, just let's start with this. How important would you say they are to the overall health of the city's economy? Very important. If you look at the path, there's uh, 1,200 retail services and storefronts, uh, um, well over 5,000 people employed. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very important driver. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at it, what's like right now, um, uh, you know, it's clearly the numbers are down. Um, you know, many people are working from home, as you said. There are a great number of uh, retailers that are open, and there is, you know, clearly traffic in the path. I go down on a regular basis and spend time in the office. Uh, probably the most important thing from our perspective right now is going to be around ensuring that this uh, next batch of federal aid for small business rolls out in a timely fashion. Uh, I think that's going to be really important as we enter into stage two to, to look after small retailers. And a, a key focus we've had is around worker confidence. Like, really, what's important here is to get office workers back to the office. I mean, we are in a health emergency still, so we have to be cognizant of that. But uh, a lot of work has been done in terms of uh, ensuring that protocols are in place. Like, uh, you have to wear a mask in the path. And when I go down there, it's highly compliant. Everybody's wearing a mask. It's great. It's prompts for physical distancing everywhere. You know, public health advice is being adhered to. And I think the, you know, Probably one of the key messages for me in this conversation today, Steve, that I've got to get across to everybody is like, you know, the office is not going away. Um, the workers that these small retailers rely on, people like Joseph here with us today, um, they will come back. Uh, you know, businesses are always going to want to have, um, you know, a high quality office space for their employees, for employee growth and collaboration, you know, particularly the large uh, national uh, headquarters in, that are located in the financial district in the path. And those workers, they're going to want a vibrant experience. Okay, uh, let know, me so jump in a, here for a second, uh, Grant, because uh, you and I have both mentioned the path a number of times already, and I don't want to assume that everybody knows what that is, because if you're not familiar with the financial district in downtown Toronto, you may not know it. So, Sheldon, let's go to top of page two here and bring this graphic up right now so we can explain to everybody who is unfamiliar with it what it is, because it is a... Well, as the name suggests, it's a path of, 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 you know, underground systems in the city that connects 75 different buildings to the so-called path. There are two major department stores on it. There are nine hotels on it, numerous tourist attractions. There are six subway stations along with Toronto's busy at transit hub, that's Union Station. And it actually is 30 kilometers long, 3.7 million square feet of retail space, 1,200 restaurants, shops and services. It generates roughly, imagine this, $1.7 billion in sales annually in normal times. And there are an estimated 4,600 jobs in the path. And most importantly, 
When the weather gets awful in Toronto, as it always does every year, the path is a great place to hang out because you've got like a, a whole underground city there with lots of stuff to do. Uh, Samantha, pick up the story from there. Is there any sense of what percentage of workers uh, in, in the office, uh, who are in the office rather, and how many are still working remotely? So we estimate right now only two to 10% of office workers have actually returned to the office. Our team is focused on returning people to the office and reducing and or mitigating the risk of the virus spread. So we've implemented a lot of strategies for clients in Toronto and across Canada to do that, which are a mix of physical interventions and behavioral protocols to make sure that people can operate uh, within their office environment and trust that everybody is doing the best they can do to reduce that risk of spread. However, um, we are still seeing that reduced rate of return. So while we have produced plans that actually maximize the capacity uh, thus far and still, and still let people be somewhat safe, um, we still see that reduced rate of return. And I think one of the reasons is the reluctance to take public transportation. We know from the TTC and the study they produced in the summer that ridership was down 86%. So psychologically, I think people aren't prepared to take public transportation, and that greatly affects the downtown population. Have you been on the subway or streetcar or bus lately? I have not. However, my son, who's a higher risk taker than me, <laughs> has, has taken both. And he said, Mom, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> I was just going to say that. I'm on it all the time. I mean, I'm on, I'm on the subway uh, quite frequently, and it's, it's perfectly fine. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. masks up. And uh, if you don't have one, they'll hand you one as you walk in. And it really mm -hmm. looks like, you know, it, 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 so I guess what I'm getting at here is, uh, it, you know, the TTC, I don't think, is any longer a good enough explanation for why people aren't coming back because the TDC seems perfectly safe. In which case, why, why do you think there's additional reluctance by people to come back? Because 2 to 10% of people back in those buildings is not mm -hmm. very much. Well, we may see it shift as the weather changes. So um, what I like to say is it, a Canadian uses any excuse to be outdoors in the summer. So we've had the summer you know, Canada effect on the office environment. But now that uh, kids have returned to school, and we're going to start seeing colder weather, people might slip into the office more. Um, also, I think that working from home was a bit of a novelty at first, but um, that's sort of starting to wear thin. We are seeing that people are, you know, there is a, a productivity loss that's happening now that we didn't see in the summer months, and people are sort of getting wary of Zoom meetings, so they're having Zoom fatigue. So I do think we'll probably start to see an increase now, of course, if we're all indoors and we start to see an increase in the virus more so than we are now, then we're going to have that reversal. But let's say I'm positive that uh, in October, November, we'll start to see a bit of an increase downtown. And then we'll see what happens, of course, you know, if people aren't behaving and, uh, and we see more of the virus spread. So, of course, that's always the, the big factor. Right. Gotcha. Joseph, let's tell your story here. Where do you work in the path? I work at a salon in the Standard Life Center. Which, and I've worked in I've worked in the TD Center. I've worked at Richmond Adelaide Center. So right so in the heart of the financial the, district. Right in the heart of it, yes. And when business is normal, in other words, when there's not a global pandemic affecting the path and everything else, how's business? Business is fantastic because if you have 40 floors above you that are full of people and thousands of people walking by your door, you tend to have business. But now we have... We're down 90% at our business. Well, that certainly jibes with the number Samantha just gave us. So what, are you yeah. still going into work? I, I've gone from four, four 10-hour days to one three-hour day a week. Yikes. What's that done to your bottom line? Well, there's no bottom line left, Steve. Hmm. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, it's just, it's, so I'm taking, I'm doing hair at people's homes. I've become a traveling hairdresser is what I've become. <laughs> Do you like that? Not really my gig, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what do you think is going to... I mean, obviously, you know, given what Samantha just said, we need people to feel comfortable enough to return to their offices, which will create the foot traffic that will put you back in business. What's, what's it going to take for that to happen? Well, if there's not another outbreak, we'll be okay. But mm -hmm. I think... People are very scared at this point. I'm very fortunate, Steve, because I can walk to work. Like, I don't need to be afraid of transit, but my partner takes transit all the time. And it's never been better, he says. So, you know, like, I just think we need to take and start moving people back in. 
slowly. And as you go to work down there, Joseph, do you have any, you know, as you, do you have any fears about contracting the virus or, you know, engaging with people, that kind of thing? Steve, I've become the Lysol and the Clorox king and the alcohol king at my salon. So <laughs> I'm not really worth, we're safe, we're in masks, we're in rubber gloves. So I'm not really worried about, and we tend to do people who there's absolutely zero walk-ins to our business now. So people who are coming, uh, we've known for 20 plus years. Well, I think we've got to get Eileen Davila on speed dial, Joseph, because you'd be a great goodwill ambassador for public health in this city. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> uh, okay, Grant, pick up the story if you would. Give us a sense of what's happening to, to the rents that businesses are paying right now, because clearly with not enough business coming in, uh, I don't know how they're paying their rent. So what's happening? Well, an, an important uh, element that the federal government brought out was the uh, commercial rent program, SECRA, and uh, that, that ran until the end of September, so it, it's expired now. Um, there are reports that they do plan to roll out uh, another small aid package, uh, small business aid package, and uh, that'll be retroactive to October 1st. And so, you know, the rent is the biggest fixed cost these places have, these businesses, and so it's really important we get that in place to help them over the hump. It's a lifeline for them. Um, and, you know, clearly... Um, uh, um, tenants and landlords have ongoing conversations. Uh, you know that's part of the relationship they have, um, and certainly the you know these landlords understand what is happening to tenants, and they're you know doing whatever they can to help them with regard to that. Um, so, but I think the key thing here is this aid package is absolutely critical for small business right now because we do have a bit of a hump left that we're going to have to get through. Well, the provincial government made an announcement just the other day, worked out to something like a thousand dollars for for each small business that that uh, was eligible for it. How much of a help does that help? Uh, I think the one you're talking about is the the uh, personal protective equipment, so that certainly helps. But this particular one is specifically with regard to the rent. Uh, the secret program allowed the small business only pay 25% of their rent, and it was applied for by the landlord. The new program um, we're hearing will be applied for by the business, which is great, puts it in their control. So, uh, but it's important we get that money into their hands immediately. So, you know, these conversations are underway, and I think we'll see something quite quickly there. Right. A uh, secret just for those, because uh, there's a lot of acronyms out there, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance. But that was, if I understood that program right, the landlord had to, I mean, the landlord had to apply for it and play ball. And not that many of them, as it turns out, wanted to do that because it meant them taking a 25% haircut. So how successful was the program? Uh, there's there's various reports on it. Certainly with the landlords I talked to and I have a relationship with on a regular basis, they all applied for it on behalf of their tenants that qualified. One of the issues with this program was, you know, not everybody qualified, depending on your loss of business, the size of your business. Um, so, you know, I think there was limitations understood with that, and they are looking to address those limitations in the new program. And as I said, they have to get it out there, like, you know, it needs to happen now. Joseph, I hope you didn't take offense when I said the landlords have to take a 25% haircut on things. I didn't mean to disparage your business there. <laughs> just for the record, no. just for the record. Uh, Samantha, you're, you're the landlord, right? So uh, how successful was this program from your vantage point? Well, we're not quite the landlord, but we do represent a lot of landlords. And um, some landlords didn't apply for it, and some did. So we've had mixed results. We do have folks at Cushman and Wakefield who can help with that though. They do help people apply for it and help with that program. That's part of our asset services group. So I am happy to hear that the businesses can now apply for it directly because I think that's a much better solution than having that extra step in the middle. Um, I also know landlords didn't really wanna be responsible for it. So um, I think it was a, a bit of an onerous task on them. Um, so hopefully we'll see some um, pickup with that, the small businesses. I just hope the, the process is not too onerous on them or too bureaucratic because I know some small businesses are barely hanging on. I mean, rents are extremely expensive down, downtown in the path and um, small businesses, you know, operate on very lean margins, so. Maybe you could fill in some blanks there because again, people who are outside the capital city of the province uh, may not appreciate how much you do have to pay for rent in the financial district. Can you put some numbers on that for us? Sure. So it's not unheard of for a small business, let's say that's even, you know, 300 square feet to pay $10,000 a month. So, yes. um, you know, and some small businesses, uh, you know, retail businesses can pay twenty, twenty-five thousand $25,000 a month. And as we all know, retail is a very hard industry and has been, has been hit, it's been decimated, of course, by COVID. And so when you're paying $25,000 a month and trying to meet your own payroll, it's a very, uh, 
a very hard task to, to, to manage. Joseph, what did you guys do with the salon in terms of trying to deal with issues around rent? Catherine spoke to the landlord and I think she's got the 25% rebate or whatever. I'm not really, I really don't know what's happened with that. I just know that she's working seven or six days a week. She's going in to try to stay afloat. Hmm. She's and, going in from Monday to Saturday. And you know, like, she, did she work something out with the landlord? She she worked something out, yes, but you know what I mean? Hmm. When you're 90 to 95% down in business, what you work out with the landlord from 10 or $12,000 12, a month is not a lot. I've worked at a salon in TD Center where they were paying 20000 a month. So 20000 a month with 25% is still, if there's no money coming in, or there's no there's no traffic. You're not you're not really ahead with anything. I feel anyway. Sure. Ha, has and, she had to lay I, off staff? I, pardon me. Has she had to lay but, off staff? No, our staff are all self-employed in her salon. I see. So she she's not like we're all contractors there. So she's been very fortunate with that. So we can come and go and pick and choose our own hours. So. So do you uh, do you rent a spot from her? Is that how it works? Yeah, yes. So, well, like we, she takes a commission cut from me. She does. So really, it's like rent. So it's like with myself, Steve. I'm usually in the path at seven in the morning to five in the evening, four days a week. Hmm. Like when I was when I was working full time, when when I had clients versus because you know hundreds and hundreds of people would walk by our door a day. Now we probably have fifty. Like I was in Wednesday, and there was probably fifteen people who walked by. So our tower is about a two to five percent capacity, and I guess a lot of your business would have been just people spontaneously deciding, "Oh, I've got fifteen free minutes. I'm going to jump in and get a haircut now." Yes, except well, exactly. You have that, especially men. <laughs> yes, because men because men tend to be in a rush for everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, let's put some more stats on the record here. And uh, Sheldon, if you would, I'm on the bottom of page three here because Cushman and Wakefield, that's Samantha's firm, uh, recently did a global study on the future of office real estate. And here's what it found: the COVID-19 effect on office space will surpass the 2008 financial crisis with the steepest level of vacancies in the U.S., Canada, and European countries. The global office vacancy rate will rise from 10.9% pre-crisis, that's basically back in the fourth quarter of 2019, will go from 10.9% to 15.6% in the second quarter of 2022. Now, with economic and employment recovery, global office vacancy is expected to return to pre-crisis levels of approximately 11%, but they're looking at the year 2025 before that happens. And rents are expected to bottom out by the first quarter of 2022 and return to pre-crisis peak levels in 2025. All right, let's unpack uh, a lot of the information there. Uh, Samantha, uh, you know, I guess the good news is you see a comeback coming. I guess the bad news is five years from now? Well, not quite, because uh, Toronto and Canada in general fares better, fares better than the global and U.S. statistics. So I'd like to put that in perspective for Toronto, if I may. So while those stats show a 10% vacancy globally, I think or so, I can't see the slides anymore, but I think that's what it said. Toronto really has been at 2% vacancy downtown for a number of years. We've had the tightest office market in all of North America, which means that we've had higher rents and less vacancy than any other city. However, right now that has grown to about four, four and a half percent. So we've seen subs, a, a number of sublets come on the market, which mean people who lease space normally are trying to shed space and lease it to someone else. So we've seen a little bit of that happen. However, we are still one of the lowest, we, if not the lowest uh, vacancy rate in all of North America because we have a very um, robust tech market, et cetera. That doesn't mean office occupancy, of course, that just means people who are renting spaces. We also have forecasted for Toronto, we will see the recovery by 2024 rather than 2025. And we will see um, quite a, a lot of recovery by uh, fourth quarter next year. So, but still, again, that, doesn't, uh, that does not translate into people actually returning to the office, which contributes to helping people like Joseph. So uh, what we are doing, uh, we've got a lot of programs in place. Globally, we've done a tremendous amount of research 
on the physical interventions and behavioral protocols to put into place so people can trust coming back to the office. So we are putting those programs into place, but I think it has to do with, of course, just building that trust. And that's the issue I think TTC is having. So yes, it probably is relatively safe. People in Canada are very compliant. We're wearing our masks, we're washing our hands, but we just have to um, help people feel that. Uh, level of safety and get them back to the office place. Well, Grant, let me pick up on the issue I hear about uh, from lots of people, which is it's not that they have any lack of trust in the TTC and the subways, the buses and streetcars and so on. It's when I get to my office building and when I have to wait on the ground level to get up an elevator to go up 72 floors, it could take me 45 minutes to an hour and a half just to get up to the office if you're only allowing four people in an elevator at a time. How do you get around that conundrum? Well, that's a that's an interesting question. So I, I've seen the math on some of this, and uh, I you know I think to Samantha's point is that uh, people are going to come back in a staggered fashion. So what we're going to find is they're not going to bring everybody back into the office at the same time. So it's not like you're going to have the same number of people necessarily going to a floor. And also, there's a lot of conversation about uh, what I'd classify as more of. of uh, uh, temporal aspect from the point of view of people are going to have staggered hours also, where, you know, clearly some people make a point of going in at seven o'clock every day uh, and leaving at three o'clock, et cetera. So, so that is somewhat more manageable. I mean, there are protocols, very good protocols in place in all of the major buildings with regard to that. They have a consistent protocol around physical distancing for lineups uh, and number of people in the elevator, et cetera. Um, my experience currently, I go into the office on a regular basis. I'm there at least one day a week. And um, it's it's works fine, quite honestly. Now, to everybody's point, the numbers are lower. The numbers I've heard are, you know, somewhat higher than the two to ten percent. I'm hearing, you know, we were reaching the closer to the fifteen percent mark, sort of after Labor Day. But it's it's really, you know, people um, the the confidence piece around protocols uh, that we've talked about, both in the office from Samantha's perspective and in the path overall, and on TTC and Go Transit, etc., will be a key driver here. And it's important for people to know that those protocols are in place. They'll be, you know, actually pleasantly surprised when they come down and they return to the office and see how well organized it is. Okay, Grant. But if Samantha, if if her prognostications turn out to be correct and Toronto's situation is, in fact, more buoyant uh, than, say, the rest of the world, United States, European Union, and so on. She's still anticipating that we don't get back to, you know, approaching normalcy until a year from now. And I guess I need to ask you, what do you guys do for the next year? Well, there I go back to my original point, quite honestly, Steve, that I started with is, there clearly is a gap here that needs to be filled and there needs to be targeted specific federal funding for small businesses, you know, like Joseph's and like hospitality, et cetera, that recognizes that there, there's this is beyond everybody's control. We're still managing a health emergency. Um, and this is extended longer than probably any of us ever envisioned when it started back in March. Um, and that'll be absolutely critical to maintaining, you know, the quality of what people expect when they come back. I mean, Toronto is very fortunate. We're talking about AAA, you know, office space, like high quality space with great amenities. Um, we are well positioned in the global market. Um, we just need to make sure that we make good policy decisions around supporting small business right now. Um, and as the regulars come back, the trade will pick up. Joseph, mm -hmm. what would you like to see over the course of the next year in order to get more foot traffic in that building of yours? I would like to see our mayor speak about the underground path a lot more. I've only heard him since June speak about it once, and our pri our premier or whoever to take and put a lot more focus on the underground system, because everybody is worried about everything else that's out at street level, and there's no worry about where we are in the underground. Do you think you've been a forgotten chapter in this whole drama? We're totally we're like the lost city. Hmm. What's it so going to take that, to get you found? So. <laughs> It was people have to speak and bring it forth on the news, the media to let and let them know that it like, as he said, the protocols and everything are in place down there. So you can't be in a more cleanly social distance because everything is up to par down in the underground for people to come. So you've arranged things in your salon to make sure that that customers everything. are two meters apart and all that business. Yeah. Yeah, our chairs were six feet apart. We're all that has all been put in place since the end of June. Now we just need people to sit in the chair.
<laughs> right. <laughs> I'm coming, you know, Joseph. I'm coming. <laughs> like, 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 Steve, I can have all the Lysol wipes and alcohol I want, but if I'm only washing me down, that's not really making me any... <laughs> any revenue at all. So. No, I get you, but somehow you, uh, somehow all of you have got to be able to uh, convince, I'm not saying it's all on your shoulders, but you've got to convince people that, that this is a safe place to go, that they're going to want to go to, uh, to try to get their lives back to normal. That, that sale has not yet been made, apparently. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say, but a lot of people who've been mandated to work to, from home really aren't supposed to be down in the towers either, Steve. Hmm. I hear that from clients also. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So if if they're mandated to work from home, they're not supposed to be down in the towers. So that's of no help to us either. So, Samantha, do you think companies should start to advise their employees that it's now safe to return to work? Well, I don't like to use the term safe because I, you can't say anything is 100 percent safe because the virus is invisible. Hmm. However, I do feel that if they implement the right strategies, uh, the physical interventions with the behavioral protocols, and people buy into this, everybody has to buy into it, then we can um, pro produce or create an environment that re that really mitigates the risk of virus spread. So we've done that for our own teams. Our, uh, we rolled out the return to office for Cushman nationally, and we were our own guinea pig, and we're now rolling that out to clients across Canada. And if people follow the things that we recommend, I do believe that they can trust coming back to the workplace. But again, everybody has to buy into the strategy because one rogue person who decides they don't want to wear their mask or they don't want to wash their hands on a regular basis or they get up and they walk around and, and you know, and, and are not social distancing, then, of course, that's sort of like the, uh, the rotten egg in the whole dozen. Right. So I think that um, you have to have that uh, trust level with all your fellow employees. Well, Grant and Joseph have already told us that they have started to go back into their places of work uh, on a more or less basis. How about you? What are you doing? Um, I've been back twice. I wasn't on the phase one list uh, to go back. And I actually asked to go back and my own team told me, no, you weren't on the list. We're not going to let you back. Um, but I'm on the list to go back in January. And you anticipate that you will? I anticipate that I will, although I would like to work flexibly, which is what we're seeing from a lot of people, that they would like to have a more flexible uh, job style. So where I don't want to be 100% exclusively from home, I don't want to be 100% exclusively from the office either. So I would like to go in maybe three days a week because I do find that, uh, especially for people my age and older, this has provided a lot of work-life balance. So our stats show that we predict as many as 30% of people will want to continue to work from home long term and a greater number than that will want to continue to have a flexible work environment. We also do see that due to physical distancing and increased circulation required in the space to mitigate the risk of virus that we will see decompression in the office space. So let's say before we based our numbers if you had 100 people in the office we might only see 70 people in the office in the same amount of space long term. So there will be less density which will also affect the downtown economy. Offsetting that, we have a number of new office buildings that are uh, being built right now. So in the years to come, we will see more density in general in the CBD. But for a short time, I do expect there to be a decline in density. What does CBD stand for? A central business district. Central not, business not, district. Uh, not, not, not marijuana or oil or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> That was a different show. <laughs> it's a different show, different acronym. Right. Well, to the extent that there has been, you know, obviously there have been many takeaways from this pandemic, but one of them surely as it relates to how people work is that we're discovering that we actually, can, many people, shouldn't say we, many people can and prefer to work at least some of the time now from home as opposed to going into work, uh, you know, five days a week as they used to, or more in some cases. Grant, I wonder what you think that means. What does that portend for the demand on office space going forward, for whether employees are going to come back to the office in the numbers that they worked previously? What do you say on that? Uh, I think where I would lean towards is that we're probably going to see some degree of a change in the ecosystem of how people work. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, there will be, as we've heard here, uh, more people who want to spend a day or two at home that might never have previously, quite honestly. Um, I think we'll also see, to a point Samantha made, sort of a, a de-intensification of offices. There's been a huge... Um, uh, over the last decade, uh, shrinking in the square foot allotted per employee. 
Um, and I can see us moving back to physical setups that, you know, go back to almost the private office environment where actually your per square foot per employee actually goes up. So, um, you know, the, the number of people on any given day may be somewhat less than it was, but, you know, this is not a situation where we're going to find that we're going to be running at these low numbers for an extended period of time. As people start to come back, you know, we're into some of the early adopters now, uh, and they're going to bring more people back with them. And as long as the environment's there, which is a critical point that we've got to maintain the environment in terms of the quality of the experience, both in the offices, uh, which we've done, and also, you know, in the retail environment, more and more people will come back. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. And just in our last 20 seconds, Grant, it, you know, but before the people come back, businesses are going to have to get through that interim period. What percentage do you think are not going to make it? Well, that's I, I can't speculate on that. I mean, this this has been very challenging on retail and hospitality. I think the important thing now is that we have to focus our programs, uh, you know, federal programs and provincial programs on targeted industries like that that we know are going to really, really uh, be hit hard during this period of time and minimize the amount, uh, you know, in, in terms of damage to that. Um, but, you know, we're very positive that, uh, you know, these are very entrepreneurial people who find ways to do things if we give them the opportunity. And that's really what this is about. Make sure they have enough money to get by and they'll find an opportunity to make sure they're going to be there when, when the better times return. Well, we wish everybody well in that regard. And, and Joseph, can I just say that I, I think we did you a solid today. Sounds like Samantha wants to get her hair done at your place. So we'll, we'll hook you two up <laughs> after this is all over, okay? But Steve, I'd like to say this to you too before we leave. Maybe the towers could think about giving people some type of break on the parking because you would actually have people drive down to the salon and park. But with the price of parking down there with an empty parking lot, there's still no any type of break on parking for people to drive down to our business. Oh, really? People, Joseph, are no, you saying that $35 for four hours of parking is too much? Yeah, it, no kidding. It, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Grant I'm Hume, Samantha Sinella, Joseph Bennett, really good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight, and sincerely, good luck to you all. Thank, Thank you, you very Steve. Much. Thank you. University and college students went back to school this fall. It wasn't as it usually is, no big frosh week or orientation blowouts. But it wasn't nothing either. You might even be surprised to hear that students went back at all rather than doing their studies online. That's because it's a real mashup. Here to give us a sense of what post-secondary life is like right now, we welcome, in London, Ontario, Hope Mahood, a third-year English and Classics student at Western University and coordinating editor of the student newspaper, The Western Gazette. In Aurelia, Ontario, Brandon Real Amyot a third-year political science and media student at Lakehead University. In downtown Toronto, Sophia Zamorano, a first-year engineering student at the University of Toronto. And in the Beaches neighborhood in the provincial capital, there's Akshay Mohan, an international PhD student specializing in mental health at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the U of T, where he's also a teaching assistant and student organizer. And it's great to see some of you again and some of you for the first time because uh, uh, we did have a few of you on the program, uh, I guess, some months ago to check in, and we thought it would be wise to, to see how things are going now that you're, uh, well, I don't know what, four, five, six weeks into your school years. So, Hope, start us off. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, it's definitely different than it's ever been before. So, all of my classes personally are online this year. One of my roommates has some classes in person. But it's a whole different experience. Suddenly, I'm spending roughly 12 hours a day on my computer as opposed to in person in classes with my friends, which is definitely taking its toll. Taking its toll in what way? 12 hours a day on a computer? Well, I think it's a lot. It's eye strain. It's definitely a mental toll as well. So I think it definitely is taking away from that human connection. And it's a little isolating, I'd say. Interesting. Brandon, how about you? Yeah, I would echo those comments. It's definitely been challenging. I'm also on my computer uh, more, more, more of the day than I am doing anything else at this rate. And uh, it, it's strain on the eyes, strain on the back, uh, strain on your wrists when you're typing. Um, there's a lot of elements that just aren't the same. And I don't know that I expected it to be, but I don't think I quite expected it to be like this. And confirming, are you all online all the time for your classes? 
Yeah, for myself. You are. Okay. Sophia, give us your update if you would. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you would have told me a couple years ago that I was going to be starting my first year of university completely online, I don't think I would have believed it. It's definitely been an adjustment to not only have the transition into university, but also have the transition into online university. Uh, so it's been uh, definitely challenging, but I'm enjoying it. Um, and it's been it's have its ups and downs, but I still love it. It's interesting that you say you're enjoying it. What aspects of it are you enjoying? Um, I guess the first that university comes with. I'm meeting a lot of new people, even if it's online. I'm still here on residence meeting new people as well. Um, definitely getting to study what I enjoy all the time is a bonus, even though it may be online. Uh, it's still something that I enjoy. And are you in residence or at home? Yeah, I am in residence. You are in residence. Okay. Are all the rooms in residence filled? There is definitely a lot of empty rooms here. I know we are maintaining just single rooms, no roommates because of COVID restrictions and safety procedures. Um, so it is quite empty, but um, there are still significant amount of students in residence. Gotcha. Akshay, how about you? How are you managing? Um, I would say overall, it's definitely been an adjustment on the, um, I would say on the positive side of this online university adjustment is not having to commute between the East End to downtown Toronto. Um, it is also easier to be able to switch between different things because mostly all of them are on the computer in the same physical space, which is my home. Um, I think on the negative side, there's definitely this aspect of losing that sense of community and social connection that one naturally has when one is physically co-located in a classroom. And also studying, I think, is extremely hard because um, these natural study groups form when one is in classes which I do not think are forming when one is doing things online. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, let me go to you on this angle of the story, because we've had university presidents on this program, we've had college presidents on, uh, you know, rectors, provosts, professors, uh, teaching assistants, you name it, everybody. And, and they have all, at one point or another, acknowledged the added um, mental health issues that arise when you spend 12 hours a day in front of screens and have no human contact. So what I want to know from you, Brandon, is have, well, for example, Lakehead and Aurelia, have they put extra mental health support systems in place to help students at this time? I don't know about extra. Uh, the reality is, is that our institutions have anemic funding as it was before the pandemic. And while we've seen uh, just recently an announcement from the provincial government to increase mental health supports, uh, we tend not to see those things actually trickle down to hiring more staff. And uh, for Lakehead, I know that the supports are available for me and I'm accessing them, which is great, um, but it's certainly not the same and it's not uh, the same, I, I wanna say quality, but that might be unkind uh, of the in-person aspect of you know counseling, uh, other mental health supports. So the universities and colleges are, I think are trying their best to make do with the situation, but uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not what it should be. Understood. Sophia, based on what you know of your own circumstances and those of others who are living in residence with you at U of T, mm -hmm. if somebody's in trouble, do they have access to extra mental health help? Not that I know of extra, because I'm not too sure of the resources we had in previous years. But I do know that we have uh, quite a few resources that we can access if we ever do need them. I know we have a great residence life team here that is willing to help that I've also accessed myself. And I know that there are support. I just don't know what they compare to in the previous years. Understood. Okay, let's, uh, you know, Hope, uh, you had a piece in the Toronto Star not too long ago, which is pretty good for a university student. So I want to read a little excerpt from that and then come out with a question. Sheldon, can you put this graphic up, please? When classes suddenly switched online in late March, no one pretended the quality of instruction was the same as in the classroom. Students were told to be patient and understanding as their university and professors adjusted to this new normal. But now, months later, nothing has changed and universities must acknowledge students' losses. Students do not learn as effectively online as they do in person. Now, admittedly, you wrote that a few months ago and now we're in October. Is anything different now? 
I would say a couple things are different. So one thing is a lot of the professors I did have who were struggling with that online tradition transition, be it through just not understanding how to run Zoom content or how to run our course website. I think a lot of them have now, if not learned themselves, have gotten teaching assistants or other people to kind of help them out. That said, I would still say it doesn't compare to the in-person experience if only because we're not accessing on-campus services anymore. Ultimately, our tuition pays for so much more than just our in-class instruction. It pays for our recreation center fees. It pays for on-campus study spots like libraries. It pays for access to computers and physical materials in the libraries that now, if not are totally inaccessible to us, are extremely limited. And So I would say even though, sorry, please go ahead. I was just going to say, let me follow up with this, because because in essence, I mean, I heard um, the U of T president, Merrick Gertler, the other day say that uh, he was essentially told on a Friday that they needed to move 6,500 courses online, something that would normally take 10 years to do, and they did it over a weekend. So I, I, I presume the students have some sympathy for the task that was at hand for the administration to try to put so much online immediately? Yes, absolutely. And I would say I have so much sympathy for the professors, especially. Ultimately, a lot of them were not trained how to use Zoom or how to use any type of online platform before being told to run a course for hundreds of students online. And I think all of them did their best. And I think all of them really did try to bring a really valuable experience to the online platform. Whether or not they were successful in that due to lack of training, I think is another matter entirely. And I don't think we can discount the fact that students did have a drop off in their quality of experience in March. For sure. Actually, help us understand this. Um, from what I understand, some classes happen in real time on Zoom or Skype or whatever, and others, you know, the, the instructor or the professor will record something, put it up there, and students can watch it, you know, whenever they want. How's it working for you? Um, I would say it's been working well. In, I, I would say, um, one, on the technical aspect, as, as the students have also mentioned, um, things are a lot more smoother, and I have not really experienced any significant technical difficulties. Um, I do feel there is a social aspect of the experience that is missing online, just because you cannot see everyone's faces um, especially the other peer students, and you cannot have real-time conversations with them as used to. Um, personally, for me, um, the notion of a flipped classroom has worked really well. Um, for example, in one course where we have pre-recorded lectures that we watch over the week, and then it's followed by a real-time online component where the focus is less on delivering the material, but the focus is on sharing what people are facing as challenges or questions related to the material. And the professor has been excellent in being able to resolve questions there. Now, Sophia, if you were going into the classroom and you had a question or a concern or a query after the lecture was over, you simply walk up to the professor and you ask him or her. Uh, you can't do that now. So how do you get access to your professors if you need it? That's a good question. We have uh, quite a few platforms that the professors have set up in order to ask questions. Um, we can email them, we contact them through our student portal, um, many other ways that we can contact them. Similar to actually most of my classes have been delivered through a flipped classroom method where it's on online pre-recorded lectures and then office hours where we can ask questions and have one have dialogue with the professors. Um, and that has also definitely helped a lot whenever any of us have questions. But to be clear, when you need them, you can get access to them? Yes. You can, okay. Brandon, what's your experience on that? If you need to get to a professor or an instructor, can you? It, it varies, I would say. Uh, I come from an area where broadband isn't always uh, accessible. So even for the student, if you send an email, sometimes it doesn't go through, that sort of thing. Um, generally, my professors are responding within, uh, you know, a few hours, if at most two days. Um, it's certainly challenging when a lot of courses have consolidated. I have a political science course as an example that's being taught between the Thunder Bay and Aurelia campus of my schools or my school. And uh, I think there's about 60 students in the class. So, it, you know, normally what would be a 30 person class is doubled in size and only one professor with no TAs is covering it. So uh, definitely a challenge to respond to everyone. And uh, for myself, most of my courses are asynchronous. So we're not necessarily uh, learning 
in real time. And that's simply because international students, some of them are still in their home countries. And uh, it's not really fair to expect someone to show up at 3 a.m. for a, uh, a in-person or Zoom class. No, understood. Uh, okay, let's do something really crass here and talk about money. Because uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no post-secondary institution in the province that has given students any meaningful breaks on tuition and various other fees, uh, despite the fact that the university experience or the college experience is nothing like it would otherwise normally be. Uh, Hope, is that your situation as well? Do you get any break on tuition or fees of any kind? So we do get some break on athletic center fees, being a 25% cut. So they said it was 50% for first semester and then charging full for second semester. Now, this worked out nice for the first bit of the semester, given that our athletic centers were open. And then Western had an outbreak of two student groups, which resulted in at least 70 students catching the virus in the first month of classes. And then our athletic center, with very good reason, shut down. And now our COVID-19 testing clinic has actually moved inside the rec center. So I don't think it's going to be opening up again anytime soon. And yet we are still paying that 50% of the fee. What do you think about that? I don't think it's fair. <laughs> um, I was never the type of person who would go to the school gym. That said, my roommate was and my friends were. And ultimately, this is a service that has been taken away from them. And there are other services that I'm still paying for that I'm not using. The entire campus uh, buildings management fee. Ultimately, I'm not going on campus. All of my courses are online. I'm spending most of my days in my bedroom at the desk in my room. and. Ultimately, that's a good $100 I'm paying toward the upkeep of something that I'm not using. You're not using it, but they still need to maintain it. Does that argument have any sway for you? It does have a sway for me. I understand that. But ultimately, I also understand that universities have huge reserves and rainy day funds that they save for emergency services exactly like this that they have in their operating budget that ultimately they're just not tapping into and continuing to allow to collect interest. Sophia, any break in tuition or sundry fees for you? I know we have deferred um, some fee payments, and the university has extended service fee charges. Um, so in that case, we have gotten some leeway. But as for the overall cost of tuition, it is the same for previous years. What do you think about the fact that the tuition is the same, but the experience is quite different? It is a little disappointing, and now that I get here, I can realize it even more. Um, I'm definitely not getting the same experience I would as in person. As Hoban mentioned, um, there's a lot of services and uh, facilities that I'm not using. I haven't been to the athletic center once yet since I've um, started university, and I haven't been to libraries all as much as I've wanted to. Um, so it's uh, definitely difficult to see that. I'm paying as much as somebody in previous years would have. However, my experience in university goes as far as my laptop. <laughs> right. Uh, an engineering degree, I think, now you correct me if I'm wrong here, I think costs more than, say, a general arts, a bachelor of arts degree. Is that right? Yes, it what is you, um, what are you a little paying? bit more. Uh, roughly around 15000 for tuition a year. 15000 Okay. And now the university's position would be, you know, at the end of the day, the experience might be different, but the piece of paper you're going to get is the same as everybody else's, and therefore you should have to pay the same amount. Does that argument have any sway with you? It does have some sway because it is true. Um, I do get the same piece of paper, after all, as any other um, engineer would. However, as of right now, I haven't had any labs in person um, in comparison to other years. I haven't had, you know, the one-on-one -on -one experience, the socialization that I get from in-person classes. And I feel like that is definitely a major um, component into the engineering course. Hmm. Brandon, what's the financial hit for you like? Still paying the same prices, uh, unfortunately for us. And Aurelia, uh, our YMCA is permanently shut down, and that was our recreation facility. So we're in a bit of a unique position um, with that one. But in terms of all the other fees, we're still paying the same amount. And frankly, I understand, you know, the reality is universities and colleges still have to keep the buildings running. They still have to pay staff. Uh, they, there's still administrative costs. 
Um, the larger problem is just that the province last year cut $680 million from post-secondary institutions uh, and, and $80 million from colleges. And then, you know, students are still paying uh, a lot of the upfront cost of post-secondary institutions. So it goes back to the point that th this, that what we're facing right now doesn't exist inside a bubble. And uh, I don't think the province uh, has shown any willingness to respond to that fact. I think if the Minister of Finance were here, he would say, we didn't actually cut their budgets. What we did was we cut tuition by 10%. Now, the effect of that was to starve the post-secondary institutions to the tune of 600 million plus that you pointed out. Um, but for what it's worth, the Minister of Finance would say, I didn't cut them, I gave students a break. You see it that way at all? Uh, I would disagree with the Minister of Finance on that one. Uh, yes, we did see a 10% decrease in our tuition, uh, but we also saw um, a real hit to our institutions, which meant a decrease in the quality of our education. So in the long run, it didn't actually make a difference. What the province should be looking at is decreasing tuition over time to truly make a, a difference for students in terms of that cost to education, which at this point, you know, post-secondary is as essential as a high school degree a diploma was 30 years ago. And uh, they should be increasing the funding to post-secondary institutions for research, for, uh, you know, equipment, for uh, supports and for more faculty. That way our education can really be world class. Actually, let me get the financial story from you. Are you paying the same as you would if you were going to classes? Um, so I, I would say I am paying the same. I'm personally in a very fortunate situation that I'm part of the funded cohort. So I have my tuition um, and all the ancillary fees are completely covered by my department at the University of Toronto. Having said that, I do feel for students, both international as well as domestic students who are in the self-funded program, I think for them, it is a lot of pressure because on one hand, the likely employment opportunities that they had outside and on campus would have decreased. But at the same time, um, overall, there's a net increase in tuition over the past few years. Let's just see if we can get a better understanding of what campus life is like right now. Uh, Sophia, I'm gonna start with you because uh, I went to University of Toronto as well, uh, 42 years ago, my goodness, okay. <laughs> 42 years ago, and my recollection was the engineering students back then were a bunch of rabble-rousing crazy heads. And, uh, you know, the Lady Godiva Memorial Band and, uh, you know, painting the testicles of the horse in Queen's Park on the statue pink and all sorts of crazy stuff. Did you get to do any of that stuff this year? You know what, it's funny you mention that because I did get to do some of it, although not quite the same as previous years. We got a little frosh kit in the mail, and in there came anything that we would need to do all those traditions through Zoom. So I got a little horse where we could paint the horse on our own. Um, I got a little jar of face paint, and in the jar of face paint, we kind of painted our own face in the way that we wanted to. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily the same as previous years. They definitely tried to maintain the traditions and the spirit of, um, you know, Lady Godiva and Mr. Blue and Gold and, you know, all the fun traditions that we always had. They tried to keep them alive as much as possible. Did it work for you? Uh, I definitely got an experience. It was fun. It wasn't the same, I can imagine, uh, but I still got to meet a few people online and uh, stay in the spirit, I guess. Hmm. Hope, do you actually get a chance to walk around the campus of Western University? Yes, I do a little. So I was actually on campus yesterday doing a little project for the newspaper. And it's really weird. It's so quiet. I'm used to it being a huge, bustling, kind of beating heart of London City. And I'm around there and I'm maybe seeing 100 people pass me by in four hours. Um, yeah, it's now, quiet and it's eerie. Not, not what you had in mind, I guess. I think when I knew we were in a pandemic, it is similar to what I had in mind. If anything, there are maybe even more people than I would expected to have been on campus. Western is running a 20 to 30% of its courses in person this semester, which means we do have some in-cap on-campus activity. That said, it's a stark comparison from one year to the next, where it used to be a student hub of activity constantly happening and initiatives constantly happening. Mm -hmm. And now it's just kind of quiet. You know, Western was one of the few universities that actually said it was going to reopen and put students on campus. And then, of course, as you pointed out, those outbreaks took place and they had to shut everything down. And I wonder whether your 
more ticked off about the fact that they sort of, you know, opened and gave people, as it turns out, a false sense of hope as to what the year would be like, only to take it away. I would say, from my perspective, the experience didn't change that much after the shutdowns, at least personally. So what we had before the shutdowns was some in-person club meetings on campus, um, as well as our athletic centers. Hmm. Um, that was really it. Our libraries are still open as they were before, as is the access to campus buildings and kind of our little eateries. Some of them are still open for pick up and take out, which is what most people were doing anyway. Most people were not doing the dine and eating options. Um, that said, to bring back to part, the second part of your question is, I am a little ticked off that these in-person clubs meetings and stuff and our orientation week did have many in-person components, many more than were advertised. And I am a little ticked off that it did go that way. I think there is no proof that spread of the virus happened on campus. That said, I think it was a completely unnecessary risk, especially given Western's culture. Before the pandemic of a party school, I don't think you can expect that to change overnight just because of the pandemic. And I think the administration should have been better prepared and should have anticipated that and ultimately should have probably had a safer back to school plan for us. Well, I'm afraid that's our time, but I certainly do on behalf of I'm sure everybody watching this uh, wish you eventually at some point in your scholastic post-secondary careers a nice, normal university post-secondary experience that you're paying for. I hope eventually you get it. Hope, Brandon, Sophia, Akshay, it's great of all of you to join us on TVO tonight, and good luck. And that is the agenda for Thursday, October 8th, 2020. For single people, finding a partner or even a dinner date right now isn't a simple matter. Tomorrow, we'll explore whether the pandemic has put a dent in so-called hookup culture and brought back some of the old-fashioned modes of dating. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and Nan, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.